YouTube family, good morning, YouTube viewers, good morning, St. Paul Christian Fellowship, and all those watching all over the YouTube sphere, the spectrum, wherever YouTube is. I hope you're watching this. I hope you get helped on today. This is the Pastor's Corner. I'm Pastor Antonio Willard at St. Paul Christian Fellowship. We're here in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, two, uh, 2238 uh, Courtney Avenue. Uh, 23504 in the lovely city of North Virginia. So good morning, and uh, we're glad you're back with us on today. I want to kind of finish that piece that I started on last week concerning the love of God, because, you know, I've defined, I think I've, I've given some basic uh, biblical meanings of what the cross, because, you know, we've been doing this piece on the violence of the cross, and we know that sin caused our Savior to go to the cross for all humanity, and his blood was shed there, and he redeemed us through his love. He redeemed us through the Father's love. He atoned for us. He was our perpetuator. And so I wanted to try to close this piece out by just sharing with you a biblical worldview definition of God's love and his forgiveness and his reconciliation. And so hopefully we can get to the forgiveness piece on the day. So let's get back. I'm, I'm not gonna do an overview of what I did on last week, but I'm gonna start back from somewhere I stopped on last week and then just pick it up from there and we'll go from there. Is that okay? So let's go to Paul's writings. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul, he wrote uh, two thirds of the New Testament. He wrote these epistles. Uh, to all these various churches, these different churches that God used him to plant. And so here in 1 Corinthians 13, let's start at verse 4 and go down to verse 8a and stop there. But this is the love of God. Now, this is what we should be striving for. This is what this is the type of love that we should have for our spouses, for our children, for our co-workers, peers, our bosses. Uh, this is the kind of love we should have for uh, our fellowship in the church, our brothers and sisters in the church, and just people abroad in the world. We should be striving for this because we don't really have it. We have it by way of the Holy Spirit. It's a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. But we have to live it out, ask for it. Excuse me, I ask for it every day that he will fill me with the fruit of the Spirit and that he will help me because the first fruit of the Spirit is love. So here Paul is saying uh, to these Corinthians that if you don't have love, you don't have nothing. And so he defines agape, agape love. And so he, he defines it by saying in verse 4, this is 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4, says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Verse 8 a said, love never fails. Love never fails. And you know, that's, that's our motto for for the ministries that we have here uh, is, is called We Care. It is the umbrella of all the ministries at St. Paul Christian Fellowship, whether it's for senior citizens, our youth, uh, for marriage, for couples, for singles, for um, uh, you know any, any type of ministry leadership. Uh, it is called We Care. And, it, and, it, and it, I took it out of this particular text, love that never quits. Love that never fails. Love that never quits. It never stops. It keep on going because as believers, as Christians, that's what we should be doing in our servitude. And so this morning, just looking at that piece and glancing at that, that is one of the best biblical definitions that you can um, give, biblical worldview that you can give concerning the love of God because that's what we're striving for. That is the love that we are looking for and we're striving for. So let me pick up where I left off on last week, talking about confidence is a sign that love is mature. Confidence is a sign that love is mature. Why? It's because, you know, you, you, you believe in God, you believe in what he's giving you, you believe in what he's doing with you. And so um, you have the confidence 
and what he's doing through you. Um, because love is the heart of Christian witness. It's sacrificial love, which is critical to our testimony or our testament of how awesome his love is, how he died for us, how he bled for us, how he, he, his blood was spilled over on our behalf. And so we have confidence in Jesus Christ and the cross. So this was to satisfy the demands of God's holy justice and his wrath against sin. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5. And so I want to just kind of move into this piece this morning um, concerning 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 8. And, and um, I'm going to end with this love piece on this note. But um, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and here in verse 8, it, these words are striking. Uh, they are full of grace, full of mercy, full of power. Listen, listen to what it says uh, in these words. In 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 8, it says, And above all things have fervent love. Fervent means heated. It means, um, you know, uh, exhausting your love. Uh, it means uh, uh, intense. That's what it means. It says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. I love that. Just, I mean, when you're talking about mercy and you're talking about the grace of God and you're talking about his forgiveness and reconciliation, it's all wrapped up into that verse of scripture. You know, the word fervent, this word just means that, um, um, you know, he intensified his love through his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. And so fear involves torment or punishment. And so uh, a reality uh, the sons of God will never experience because of the fact that we are forgiven. We are forgiven. We don't have to, you know, he wants us to have a healthy dose of fear, which means not to fear him, as being afraid of him, being scared of him, as if he's the boogeyman or if he's bad or he's going to get us or punish us in some kind of way. But to fear him in the sense of reverence and in awe and respect, we love him so much because he first loved us that we fear him. And so we will never, as born again believers, as Christians, we will never have to worry about his wrath or his justice coming upon us. Because Christ has atoned for our sins. He was our perpetuator. He was the one that, you know, he took all of our sins on him. They were nailed to the cross with him. Justification, past sins. Sanctification, present sins. And glorification, future sin. So we don't have to try to work our way into God's good grace. We don't have to try to work for this. We, don't, we can't earn it. We definitely don't deserve it. <clears throat> But he's done it because of the love of the Father. Christ was obedient unto death on the cross, Philippians says, because, because of the love of the Father. Now, let's get into this forgiveness piece. Let's move from that love piece. I hope on last week, if you didn't catch the beginning or that, I kind of did a little introduction piece on last week of, of trying to define a biblical worldview about love. Let, let's, let's, let's move to forgiveness now because I hope you'll look back on last week and I hope that you will, you know, at least uh, work on that. Work on that piece from last week and then, you know, I can move on and move forward to this piece concerning forgiveness. And so forgiveness um, is stretched or it is to be strained. That means you do your very best best to just forgive someone. It, it means, uh, you know, a quoted from a Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, it is the nature of true spiritual love. If you read that verse of scripture, let me go there real quick because let me share some of these verses of scripture to back up what I'm saying so that that can help you out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, look at what it says. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Didn't we just read that in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8? Love covers a multitude of sin. And so forgiveness is when you stretch or you strain. 
to forgive somebody. That's what it is. It is the true nature of spiritual love. It means specifically that a Christian should overlook sins against him or her if possible and always be ready to forgive insults and unkindness. La lastly, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter eight, verses 38 through 39 says these words, and I want you to see it because, you know, you got to understand uh, my point, the point that I'm making here. But in Romans eight, and these last few verses, it says some powerful words, it gives us some powerful words. In verse 38, it says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that, is, that, that, in, that embodies his forgiveness. That embodies his forgiveness and not just his forgiveness, but his reconciliation as well. In Luke chapter 12, verse 10, I need you to see these words real quick and and I'm doing this for a reason. That's, and I'm not trying to really rush through this. I, I, you know, on last week, I was thinking I could just sit down and talk a little bit, give you all a biblical worldview or definition, and then call it a day. But in Luke chapter 12, there's some words here that's stirring. In verse 10, it says these words. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, watch this. Now, this is one of the best definitions of forgiveness I can give to you from the Bible. Watch this. If anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ, it will be forgiven him. But watch this. This is the kicker. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Did you hear that? Do you understand that? That means this. That means that this sin will not be removed. That means that you have sinned deliberately against God, willfully. You, you've settled hostility towards Christ. And it's an example of, listen, it's exemplified by the, by the, uh, by the Pharisees in, in Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, um, I got these verses for you here. In Mark chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, it says this. It says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, here it is again. Watch this. It will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. You will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come, which means period. Which means when you meet God at the judgment seat, and we all are going to meet him because some of us are going to meet Christ at the Bema seat, and some of us are going to meet the Father at the great white throne. So for those who have rejected, that's what this really is saying. For, for those who have rejected uh, the free gift of eternal life, for those who have rejected Jesus Christ, for those who have rejected the gospel, You've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. What the Pharisees did is they credited the power of God to Satan, to, to Old Testament Baal. They, they tried to equate the Holy Spirit with Satan, and they blasphemed against God. And it says right here, clearly states it. I've read it to you in two passages, two different passages for a reason, because I wanted you to see how important it is. You blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you'll never be forgiven. Not in this lifetime or in the one to come. You won't be, you won't be forgiven. And so that's very important that you know what forgiveness is. This is one of the best definitions that I could find in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament concerning God's forgiveness. Watch this. You know, um, and, you know, if you deliberately reject Christ, you're in confrontation with God. Acts chapter 4, verse 16. If you deliberately reject this plan of salvation, this free gift called eternal life, you're in confrontation 
with God. Acts 4, 16. Let's look at it real quick just to see what it says concerning that because it's powerful. Acts 4, verse 16. And this is a powerful verse of scripture right here too. Look at what it says, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. You know, we, you know, we, we look at stuff and, and we take things for granted, but I, I guarantee you, you shouldn't take this for granted. You shouldn't take the forgiveness of God. For, you, you know what's going to send a lot of people to hell? It's not going to be because they doubt and disbelieve. That's, that's not really, you know, that's, gonna, that's a part of it. Those are factors. Don't get it twisted. Don't, don't quote me on this and say, Pastor Willie, you're wrong. People will go to hell because they disbelieve or they doubt. Listen, why, what's going to really send them to hell is when they reject this eternal life free gift from God, his son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It, it is going to be because you have rejected the love of the father. You have rejected the forgiveness of the father and you have rejected the reconciliation of the father. Reconciliation just means that he wants to make right relationship with you. That's just a, that's just a, a plain and simple, you know. These Pharisees, they could not deny the reality of what the Holy Spirit had done through Christ. So they attributed to Satan a work that they knew was of God. In Mark chapter 3, verse 22, you'll see that there. Jesus uh, told Peter that we are to forgive seven times 70 in a day. He told us that we are to forgive. That means that if somebody has, you know, sinned against you, somebody has uh, rejected you, abandoned you, neglected you, whatever the case may be, frustrated you, made you mad, made you angry, whatever, forgive them seven times 70, which is over 140 some times a day. So all day long, we have to forgive folk. We have to find it in our hearts Ask the Holy Spirit, ask God to help us to forgive. It doesn't say you're going to forget it, but to forgive. And then when time is time go by, you won't even be thinking about it anymore. I don't care how bad it is. Some people keep stuff in them all of their lives and they, and they go to the grave with it. They take it to the grave with them, bitter, resentful, angry, mad, upset. Because they didn't know the peace of God. They didn't know God personally. They didn't know and experience his forgiveness. And so Jesus told us to forgive. He told Peter to forgive seven times, seven in a day. And so lastly, Jesus said on the cross these words, Father, forgive them for they do not understand what they do. My God, how powerful and awesome is that? If you really want a definition of God's forgiveness... All you got to do is look at the cross. Jesus said those words from the cross before he breathed his last breath. Father, forgive them for they do not understand. This were people, these were the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. This were the people in the audience who spit in his face. These were the soldiers who took, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, instrument, um, and, and took plugs of meat out of his body. Isaiah said in his account 700 years before he was born that you couldn't even recognize him. They beat him so bad. They put a thorn of crown, I mean a crown of thorns on his head and they smashed it down over his face. And so they probably ripped open his face. Unrecognizable. And then they nailed him to the cross. On top of the ridicule and the mockery, this is sovereign God of the universe. He, he did say it to the father before he gave up the ghost, as they say in the Old Testament, as he gave up his spirit, father, forgive them for they do not understand. Wow, what a powerful, listen, you're talking about a proclamation. You're talking about something that will help us to understand how powerful forgiveness is. That is one of the most powerful definitions in the Bible that you can get about forgiveness that the Savior, after being ridiculed, mocked, spit on, 
punched in the face, you know, just, I, and listen, sometimes his family didn't believe him. His, his family didn't believe him until the cross. When they saw him hanging on the cross, that's when faith kicked in and they believed. He was not just the son of man, he was the son of God. He was the living Christ. But he said, Father, forgive them. And look, it goes down through generations. It's, it, it's come to us. Father, forgive them for they do not understand what they're doing. They do not understand. And so on this morning, I hope that you've gotten something out of that. I hope that you learned a little bit about forgiveness. I wanted to keep it plain and simple because uh, I want to address on the next time reconciliation. I want to talk to you about how God wants a right relationship with us and how he has restored us unto himself through his son, Jesus Christ. He has restored us through proper relationship, through what his son did for us on the cross. Number one, he loved us so much. Number two, he forgave us and he's still forgiving us. That's still, that, that's a wonder working action right now going on in our sinful, depraved nature. Still forgiving us, still loving us. And lastly, He's reconciled us unto himself. He's, he's brought us to him. We're now, you know, I call myself his possession. I belong to him. I'm his. I don't belong to the devil and I don't belong to nobody else. I'm his. I belong to him. He's my God. He's my leader. He's my director. He's my guide. He's my source. He's my resource. He's the bishop of my soul. He's the lover of my heart who he is. He's my Christ. He's my Messiah. He's my Savior. I might be saying some things that offend some of y'all because that's who he is to me. That doesn't necessarily mean that's who he is to you. He is the bread of life to me, the living water. He is the resurrection and the gate. He is the great shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is my God. And beside him, there is no other. I don't have to look to nobody else because he is I am. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. To the Father, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl can come to the Father except through him. He's my all in all. And so this morning, he could be your all in all as well. You can experience his love and his forgiveness. The only reason why I'm able to share this with you is because I experience it every day. I experience his love every day. I experience his forgiveness every day. It's not a day that don't go by where I know that I fall short, but guess what? I also know that I have his forgiveness when I repent. You can do the same thing right now. You can repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my disobedience. Forgive me for my rebellion. Forgive me for my sins. I've sinned against you in my heart alone. I have offended you. I've grieved you and I'm sorry. Have mercy on my soul. Come into my heart and live in me on today. And I'll trust you. I will obey you. I will walk faithfully with you. You can have that assurance on today. I spoke first about, you know, I piggyback off of what I talked about on last week about the love of God. That's why you have this confidence concerning his love. I know that I know that I know. Nobody has to tell me. Nobody can convince me. The Bible has already convinced me. You don't have to tell me. No preacher in this world has to tell me about the love of God. I know it for myself because I know what his word says. And I know him personally because he has reconciled me unto himself. But he loved me in my mess and still loves me when I mess up. When I mess up right now, he still loves me. And he forgives me when I repent and turn to him. And he'll do the same thing for you on today. If you don't know him in the pardon of your sin, you could say that simple sinner's prayer. That's a simple sinner's prayer. You know, this is not about being eloquent. It's not about being academic or intelligent. It's not about having uh, achieved and accomplished a lot. It's about knowing the true and living God of the universe, the true and living God of all creations the creator himself, you can know him personally, just like I do, 
I'm no better than you. I'm no different than you. I need a, I, I need a savior too. I'm a sinner. I'm a sheep who need a savior, just like you. And so this morning, we have had fun with you this morning. We thank God for you spending time with us here uh, at the pastor's corner. Uh, again, ring the bell, subscribe, uh, come on in. If you're ever in the 757 region, we would love to have you to come in and visit with us and share with us and fellowship with us. We'd love to have you come in and just have a wonderful time of worshiping the worship experience with us. We'd love for you to do it. And so, uh, again, subscribe, ring the bell. If you want to challenge my theology, please do. Uh, there's always room for improvement, and uh, there's always uh, where we can agree to disagree. And so we love you. We bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. And grace, peace, and mercy until we meet again. We need your prayers. Bye-bye.